All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Darren St. George, and thank you for signing on this afternoon for a chit chat with uh, Sal St. George. Oh, here we go. We have Dolores. We, that's okay. We don't need your uh, video as well. Thank you. Um, thank you for signing on. Today, we are talking about Burns and Allen. And before we begin, we have a bit of a confession to make. This program was originally scheduled for 10 a.m. today. Unfortunately, the Zoom invitation, as you all diligently saw, listed it at one o'clock. So there was a bit of a discrepancy. We did have a 10 a.m. program for everyone who signed on at that time, but we see here there's still a number of people who were following it to the, the Zoom invitation and it said one o'clock. But not to worry, we are still here and you may be getting the best of both worlds. So this morning we had our program and that ran about 45 minutes and we recorded the whole session. So this morning, I'm going to, or this afternoon right now, I'm going to share a link with you and you'll get to watch that entire program. It's recorded, it has Sal and the other participants on there asking questions and discussing Burns and Allen. But we have an opportunity right now, there's no, no reason why we shouldn't be sitting and, and, and we have their questions. Um, there's no reason we can't talk a little bit more right now because Burns and Allen certainly they could fill a whole, a whole semester at, in a university. So um, let's get started. As always, we have Sal St. George. Uh, the man of the hour is here with over 35 years of experience in historic and comedic entertainment. Good, uh, good afternoon, Sal. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome aboard. And uh, we're gonna have a good time. This is gonna be fun. Uh, Burns and Allen are one of my favorites of all time. Funny, funny, funny. There's, First of all, we have to go back in time. We're going to go back to a world that doesn't exist anymore, and that's vaudeville. And some of the greatest performers that we've got, uh, that we've had, actually, have uh, came, they came out of vaudeville and burlesque. And we're talking about everybody from Bob Hope and uh, Eddie Cantor and Al Jolson and, um, oh, my gosh, Sophie Tucker, Fanny Bryce. You can make a list of all the people that came out of it, Milton Berle. Um, everybody was in that world and it was a great world because it, it was the only time, we don't have this anymore, where an act can perfect their material by doing eight shows a day over and over. If you had seven good minutes, if you had a seven minute act, you could go for years with that act. It wasn't until radio came along and they realized, oh my God, there goes my act. I've got to start getting writers. And that's when writers got into the process and they started adding all that in there. Now, before we get into that, I don't know if any of you were with me last week, but I was mentioning several books that I've been reading and I just wanted to give you an update on two books that I'm working with right now because I'm about to put together a brand new Lucille Ball lecture. And uh, the first book I'm using is called Laughs, Luck, and Lucy. And it was written by Jess Oppenheimer, who happened to be the executive producer of I Love Lucy. He was the brains behind it. Right next to Desi Arnaz, they created the entire format of what a uh, sitcom should be. And I'm excited about going through this book. These are brand new for me. I'm going to be delving through this. And then the other book I have is called I Loved Lucy. And um, this was written by Lee Tannen. Lee was a young man, I think he was in his 20s, and he met Lucy during the last 10 years of her life. And he traveled with her, went on different um, uh, press junkets. Uh, he was with her when she was creating the very last TV series that she had called Life with Lucy. The show did not work. It didn't work. She was trying to make a comeback. She thought she was going to resurrect Lucy the way everybody loved her. But at this point, she was, I think, uh, 71, 72 years old. And audiences did not find it amusing to see this Lucy doing the antics of the young Lucy. They worried about her hurting herself. It was the humor just did not work. Um, she even got all of her old um, uh, writers together. Gail Gordon came out of retirement to work with her again, and it just didn't work. It was a sad moment for her. And she went to her grave lamenting the fact that she thought 
America stopped loving Lucy because of that one show. It was canceled after I think it was they filmed thirteen episodes and I think only six or seven were were aired. So it was a, it was a sad moment for her. Um, she always complained. She said, "How is it that Bob Hope can have gray hair and I can't?" <laughs> she said, "They treat women differently in this business." Here, so, Dad, I want to pause for one let's second. Let's go on to. Yeah, I just want to pause for one second because your internet is go yeah. is becoming a little spotty. Can you um si can you sign out and sign back in? Yep, just sign out and sign okay. back in because right now I shall do that. Thank just you. Go. Yeah, it's just having a little bit a little bit trouble, so I want to make sure everybody's getting a good picture. But in the meantime, for the rest of us, we're getting some good questions cool. in the chat window asking about all the future comedy and uh, coffee. Here we go comedy and coffee chit chats. And yes, they will take place at 10 a.m. on Monday mornings. Um, and while I have you, let's see here. I have a poll. If you wouldn't mind giving this a shot, I'm curious uh, what you would be interested in learning more about. This is a new technology, so I'm trying to learn as well. If you could just click on this link or just click for your vote, whichever you would prefer. What would you like to see next? Are you interested in learning more about male comedy teams or female comedy teams? This type of information just helps us provide better lectures uh, and chit chats for you, whatever you're interested in. Uh, so let's see here. If you can see it, you can just click on that. But while Sal, before Sal uh, clicks back in, yes, they will be moving, or they will begin at 10 a.m. And I just checked the listing for it as well, and it does say that it starts at 10 a.m. So that's really good. It's, it should be clear. Let's let Sal back into the meeting. Here we go. I also sent a link in the chat to both of those books that Sal was just talking about, both of uh, the Lucy books. If you want to read along with him, uh, you, can, you can see there. And I see we also have votes for female comedy teams is what's of interest right now. Hey, Dad, welcome back. I just realized that should be female comedians. Because <laughs> <laughs> there really weren't any female comedy teams. There were only a, a couple. If you go into television, you had Lucy and Ethel, and you had Laverne and Shirley. You had Mary Tyler Moore and Rhoda. But in terms of actual comedy teams, there is only one that I found, and they were from the 1930s. You wouldn't know their names, Darren, but some of these nice people would remember Thelma Todd and Zazu Pitts. They were uh, combined as a comedy team back in the 30s, and they made a whole bunch of uh, short movies, which were very popular at the time. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we're going into another lesson there. We are, okay. but it looks like that's what that seems to be the interest. It's female right, comedy this. teams or female comedians. And this also was the interest this morning. Um, it seemed the majority are interested in learning more about female comedy teams. So yes. that's good to see it. There's consistency there. Great. Sal, would you like to yeah. take a look at some of the, um, the photos we put together from Burns right. and Allen? So uh, let's get started on this and let's talk about Sounds good to me. Yep. All right. Let me pull this up. And if they have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, any questions that you may have, just let us know. Let's see here. And I'll share my screen. Here we go. Oh, ah, there they are. Yes, they conquered <clears throat> vaudeville, radio, movies, television. We're going to talk about all of that right now. Where did it begin? Oh, I'm glad you asked, because I'll tell you. The uh, whole uh, beginning of this, let's go to George first. Um, one of 12 children. Uh, his father dies when he's nine years old. All the kids disperse, going to get street work, any kind of jobs they can do. He was shining shoes, <clears throat> working in all kinds of odd jobs. He ended up working in the basement of a... Um, uh, a, a business that manufactured and bottled chocolate syrup. They would uh, take the syrup. Yeah. Yeah. I want to. I want to cut in a sec because I realized. Let's. Um. Because I. I remember from this morning the yeah. lesson of George and his and his early life as well as Gracie. We explored her early life. I'd be interested because I'm going to share this link so everyone can watch this morning's 
um, chat and learn these learn this as well but let's take this opportunity to learn something new what else can we move on to let's move forward into their career and what and some of their accomplishments things that we ran out of time to discuss this afternoon this way between both of these programs we're, we're actually going to have a rather robust discussion about burns and allen what do you think uh -huh. i know <laughs> i'm taking you um, off of your notes i know <laughs> Yeah, I gave them a lot of material today. Um, yeah, I do. There was something I did want to mention. Um, when Gracie was quite young, and I'm trying to remember, I think she was six years old, her mother was cooking in the kitchen. And um, the young Gracie reached up on the stove and grabbed a pot handle and tipped it and the liquid, whatever it was, some kind of uh, hot liquid, poured onto her shoulder and, and, and burned her arm, the upper part of her shoulder and arm. And she was always deformed because of that. But she, that's why when you watch her, she's always wearing something that uh, pretty much covers her arm. It's um, something that she was self-conscious about her whole life. There was a story about her uh, being in bed with uh, George Burns. And she said to him, she said, uh, she always called him Googie. Googie. Uh, no, um, no, no. He was um, Natty. And she was Googie. He was Natty because he was in that burn bound. But um, she said, Natty, I'm just so glad you don't make me feel self-conscious about my bad arm. And he said, you have a bad arm? I never noticed. <laughs> his, his way of saying, it doesn't matter, Gracie. Everything is fine the way it is. But uh, yeah, she was always self-conscious about that, that uh, injury that she had uh, from childhood. Um, People ask me, and this is something we didn't talk about today. George Burns always had a cigar in his hand. And they don't realize George Burns having a cigar, Henny Youngman having a violin, um, many of these things, you know, Red Skelton laughing in between his jokes. That was timing. That's all it was. It was a means for the comic to deliver his joke, take a puff, or, or just laugh with the audience. And it's his comic timing that kept the pace of his routine. And that's why they had that. But I do want to talk about them, uh, Darren. I've got to get into them. So they meet, <clears throat> they get married um, in 1929. They met in 1922. She was from San Francisco. He was from New York City. He was always in the, um, in, in the entertainment business of some sort or, or another. Um, he always talked about how the acts that he was involved with were so bad that he always had to change his name so that people wouldn't, uh, so that he can get more work. He would, he would just change his name. The agents wouldn't know they're booking the same guy that they had a couple of weeks ago. Um, when they got into radio, they started out in 1929, as I said, they got noticed by Eddie Cantor. They went on to his show. Then he went on to the Rudy Valley show. Then they went on to the Guy Lombardo show. I know <laughs> Darren's saying, who are all these people? No, you you probably know Eddie Cantor. I know Rudy Guy Valley Lombardo. Guy. I'll take Guy Lombardo. That's two. I'll take two. Okay. Yeah. Um, but once they went on those shows, the audiences fell in love with Gracie and, and George. By 1934, they had their own um, radio show. It went from 1934 to 1950. That's how long they were on the radio. From radio, they go into motion pictures. Um, there's no stopping them. And they're working with the best of the best at the time. If you look at some of these um, uh, movie posters, this is just four out of about uh, nearly 30 movies that they made in, in their lifetime. Um, she also made several, several movies by herself, believe it or not. And uh, just Gracie Allen on her own in, these, in certain movies. But George was always involved because he really was protecting her image. He didn't want anybody doing anything with her image that was not suitable for who he is, who he created, literally. Um, so anyway, if you look at some of these uh, uh, people which they work with, W.C. Fields, there's Rudy Valley, um, Cab Calloway, Jack Benny, uh, Martha Ray. The one that I wanted you to pay attention to, I mentioned this uh, earlier, We're Not Dressing, 
on the upper left hand corner. It's always on TCM. It's a goofy comedy. It's a little silly at times, but it's a precursor to Gilligan's Island. Uh, Bing Crosby, Carol Lombard, Burns and Allen, Ethel Merman, Leon Errol, Ray Milan, all in one movie. And these are, when we, when I say they're all in one movie, these were young performers at the time. They were very young. When you look at them, you won't even recognize Ethel Merman. She's cute. She's funny. She's very uh, different than what we picture uh, years later doing uh, Gypsy. Uh, very, very different. Carol Lombard is in here, and this is about uh, maybe uh, 10 years before she uh, had her fatal air uh, accident and, uh, and perished. But uh, it's a funny movie. Enjoy it. You, you'll have a good time with it. Like I said, it gets silly, but it's silly fun. Also, um, I'm, no I'm noticing you're talking about the youth youthfulness of everyone here. You mentioned earlier about George and his cigar. All of these photos that we've seen thus far, there's no cigar. Yeah, that's that's commonplace because in movies they try. Isn't it funny? They let them drink, they let them smoke cigarettes, but the cigar, they said no. But that's more of a comedy thing. He didn't have to work on timing. He was doing a movie. He had lines. It was a different situation. Same thing with Lou Costello. You see pictures of him off camera, and he always had a stogie. He always had one. Um, at, at all times, he always had his cigar with him. So, uh, but when you see the movies, you never see any of that. They don't need it in the movies. Good I had heard I had heard once that George, that was one of his requirements for doing for taking a gig, is that you had to have uh, prepared, like in his green room, a box of cigars upon arrival. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of performers that have things like that. Um, oh my gosh, I was working at the old Mount Airy Lodge many many years ago, and I'm trying to remember who the singer was big singer and uh he had to have red and green m&ms and his m and yeah uh, red red and green m&ms he had to have brand new towels not clean towels brand new towels and a case of water um perrier it had to be perrier but those were his requirements but every every big name has that well, even today the reason for it, I know a lot of these a lot of these performers get a bad reputation for being picky or persnickety and wanting these demands. But yeah. as I understand it, it began with a uh, I can't remember the band, a rock and roll band. But they wanted to know as they're doing a tour for the next year and they're traveling the world. Every time they show up to a new theater, they wanted to know that the theater was prepared and that the theater read the contract and understood everything that was required from light and special effects and pyrotechnics. And a fast way to do that, the manager found, was to bury a very specific ask in the contract. And that's where these like green M&Ms came from. They would bury something in the contract and they could just walk into the green room, see if the M&Ms are there and know whether or not this theater is prepared for their production. Hmm. But it's it's a little bit of a nicer yeah, yeah, nicer take than just saying, saying they're the, uh, they're picky. Yeah, <laughs> there's. Um, I, I just wanted to go over a couple of uh, Gracie's lines that I always find amusing. She always made uh, jokes about her brother, her long lost brother, always looking for her brother. Her brother said this, her brother said that. Her real life brother had to go into hiding because people were looking for him all the time. But he, she did have a brother. Anyway, uh, one of her lines, her brother said, um, she won't recognize uh, her niece next time she sees her um, because um, since the last time you saw her, uh, she grew three legs. She's got three legs. And he said, Gracie, how could she have three legs? Well, that's what my brother said. He said, the last time you saw her, since then she grew another foot. <laughs> That's crazy. I love that line. Yeah. Uh, the other one I like is uh, George comes home he, and he sees all these flowers, beautiful uh, bouquet of flowers. And he said, where do you get the flowers? And she said, George, don't you remember? <clears throat> you said when I go visit Clara in the hospital, be sure to take her flowers. So when she wasn't looking, I took them. That illogical logic is so clever. It is so great. You think she's talking about one thing, and in her mind, she's in a whole different planet, a whole different different world. 
but that's what made her so funny. I always like, um, I believe George has a quote about saying that he never had to work a day in his life. Yeah. You know exactly yeah. how it goes? Yeah, he said um, that he initially, he wanted 60-40 split. He was considered the more prominent of the two when they first got together. She didn't have any experience, but she, he quickly realized that 60-40 split didn't work anymore. He said after that, from then on, she did 90% of the work and I did 10% of the work. All I had to do, he said, was go out there and say, gee, Gracie, how's your brother? And she would just go on and on, and, and he would just echo like a good straight man does. Yeah. Yeah. You, but uh, yeah, she she carried the act. One of the things, let's go to the next slide. When they got into television, uh, and we should have gone into this this morning, one of the reasons that Gracie had so many problems with TV, because they first they got into radio, and you'll see the radio um, uh, slide in a second. When they got into radio, you stand there before a microphone, you have a script in your hands, and you're just going through, uh, go back one, this is the TV one. Um, so in radio, you've got the script in your hand. And as you're doing the script, nope, that's yep. Yep, backward. Now go back, back, uh, back, back, back. That's go back. back. There's, there's radio. So when they were on radio, they had the script in their hand and they can just do their material. They, they rehearse it and then they're reading it. Nobody's seeing you, you know, you're just doing it. Once they got into television, that's when difficulties came about for poor Gracie. It was one thing to do a 30 minute radio show and have the script in your hand. It's something else to have to do a weekly TV show, 30 minutes a week, and the crux of the material is all predicated on Gracie. The stories all revolved around Gracie. They didn't have anybody else uh, in the show that they were giving material to because she was, she was the uh, uh, proponent of all the conflict in, in the show. So it got to the point with her that she was having a hard time memorizing everything. And as she's going through the seasons, they were on for eight years. Every year, she would go to George and say, George, can we, can we make this our last year? Can this be the last season for the TV show? And he would go to the sponsors and say to them, OK, guys, <clears throat> we're, we're, this is it. We're, we're done. And the sponsors would say, wait a minute, wait a minute. We'll give you more money. And then he'd come back to Grace and said, you can't believe how much they're offering us to do one more year. And she said, all right, one more year. And they would do another year, the same scenario the following year. We're leaving, more money. Gracie, can we do one more year? And it would go on like that. And eventually it got to the point she was having health problems, heart problems, anxiety, uh, migraines. And she really was suffering through those last couple of years. Finally, on the last year, she said to George, we have enough money. I, I don't want to do this anymore. And he backed out. He told them we're done. Um, she survived, I think it was eight years more after the show. When the show ended, they had a big going away party, huge. The whole cast was there, all the crew was there. Everybody was lined up in the studio. She came in and made an entrance. Everybody's applauding her, giving a standing ovation. She picked up a glass of champagne, took a sip, said thank you very much, turned around, and never went back again. She never went back on the stage after that. That was it. Um, she passed on, uh, I think it was nine years later, from a heart attack. But she was suffering all those years. It was just a difficulty for her to keep memorizing and memorizing. And man, she wasn't getting younger either, but she was only 59 when she passed, up, passed away. So, um, yeah, it was a difficult time for her in that regard. And also, I'm going, to assume, I'm going to assume at that time, is she also doing the promo spots? Because now we think of a, a TV show and it's 22 minutes plus commercials that you have nothing to do with. But at the yeah. time, were they doing their own commercials? Uh, probably. They, they were all doing things like that at that time. But uh, the, the bottom line is she had to walk away. Now... Um, one, of the, one of the points I made earlier uh, today, 
is George started out singing with a bunch of his friends that he created what they call the Pee Wee Quartet. Then he went into vaudeville and he always had a different partner that he was working with. He went through several of them until he finally met Gracie, who became the perfect partner professionally and personally for him. But he always had to have a partner. When she walked away, he was, he was stranded and he, he tried finding other people that he could work with taking the place of Gracie. The mistake he was making is he was giving Gracie's material to Carol Channing and Connie Stevens, Goldie Hawn, um, and, and they were doing Gracie's material, but they were not Gracie. They didn't, they didn't have the same Bernadette Peters. There were a lot of people that were doing it. And um, he even had his own show, which was short-lived, because he was half an act. He was half an act. And the only reason that his career was resuscitated, and this is uh, something we talked about this morning, is because when his dear friend Jack Benny passed away, he was tapped to do the Sunshine Boys as a favor to Jack. He promised Jack he would do it. He wins the Academy Award, and that resuscitates his whole career. Now he's realizing he made a movie, he won an Oscar for it, um, and he didn't need somebody alongside of him. He was able to stand on his own. He started doing TV specials, how many movies we can name off the top of our head, like Oh God, uh, which was one of his best. And, and then he continued working until 80, uh, no, he, he got the award, he was 80 years old for the Oscar and he worked another 20 years. He was 100 years old, he was still working, I think until about two or three weeks before he passed away. So, um, but he, that's where he got his self-confidence was winning that Oscar and being able to stand up on his own. I was just looking on Amazon, if anybody hasn't seen The Sunshine Boys, they did a remake um, in the 90s with Sarah Jessica Parker. And, um, but if you want to see George's version, it's on Amazon right now for $1.99 to, to stream it. So yeah. definitely worth it. The version, the, version you're, the version you're talking about with Sarah Jessica Parker, the two leads went from George Burns and Walter Matthau to Woody Allen, Woody Allen and Peter Falk, Columbo, playing the two parts. And um, it, it's, a, it's an interesting remake. The only difference is they played it more serious than George and Walter did. And when, um, when Peter Falk is yelling at him, it's, it's a little bit harsher than um, the earlier version of it. It was, a little, it was the 90s, they were trying to make it a little bit more grounded, more realistic but it just doesn't hold up as well. And it's the same words. When you talk about it, it's the same darn script. It's the same words that they did in the earlier version, but it just doesn't hold up at all. Good question. There was, oh, I gotta tell you another line. Uh, this is another Gracieism. Uh, Gracie says uh, to, her, to her friend, it seems just like yesterday that my mother tripped George as we walked down the aisle. And her friend says, I guess your family didn't approve. And she said, oh, sure they did. As a matter of fact, they applauded when she did it. <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> yeah. Again, she's taking you up down one road, and next thing you know, you're in a different road altogether. Are there any other characters, comedians, uh, or comedians that have her tone, that have adopted that type of, of humor? No. No, I can't, I can't think of anybody that can do a Gracie Allen. I, I really can't. I mean, it's easy to imitate her, but I don't know anybody else that made a career over. You know, George would get angry when people would say his wife is ditzy or she's silly or she, uh, and, and he always felt in her mind, it all makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. Everything she's saying makes perfect sense to Gracie. And when she says it, then you see it through her eyes, like the three legs. Oh, she grew another foot. So it's kind of funny because she is making sense in her own head. Would it, this seems, it seems a little strange to maybe draw this comparison, but could you say the same about Archie Bunker? No, no. He has malaprops. You know, um, you know, he has 
where he mistakes one word for another, mm -hmm. you know, um, the constipation of the United States, you know, instead of the constitution, um, th those, those, that's his style, you know, but no, he didn't, he didn't, um, have that illogical logic. Yeah. It's, it's, that's a gift, which, and George wrote most of her material. So that shows you where his head was at. He, he really knew funny. He knew what was funny for her character. And that when I say that, it was proven because when he tried putting all these other actresses in the role of Gracie, it didn't work. But if you go online and you go on YouTube, there's a great clip of George introducing his wife, Gracie, and she comes walking out and it's actually Jack Benny dressed up as Gracie Allen. And she, he's got the, the uh, hair, he's got the suit that she would be wearing, and he does her lines. It's hysterical. Jack Benny doing Gracie Allen. Um, I, think I, I think I have that here. Um, Jack stands in for Gracie? Yeah. Okay, so I'll share it in the clips here if anybody wants to take a look can at we, that. Can we put it on now? Can we see a minute of it? We can see a minute of it, yeah. Okay, yeah. here, hang on one second. Let me, let me click play on this and we can take a look at what that, oh my, it's a full episode. Did he do this for a full episode? Well, you can skip through and, and just find this. There's a scene with them doing uh, the routine in front of the curtain. Okay, in front of the curtain. I see that here. Okay, here we go. Let's take a look. We have that, and I'll share my screen so everybody can watch. And I do want to talk about Fred Astaire and them. Oh, I want to talk about, though, um, uh, What's My Line? Because I'm okay. sure everybody did their homework and watched the What's My Line clip. So we need to discuss that as well. But here, if everybody can take a look, here's the, uh, here's a little bit of Jack Benny as Gracie. Can you hear it? Say hello. Hello. <laughs> Hair looks very pretty tonight. I know. You know. I had it done at the beauty parlor. Oh. And George, I heard the most wonderful joke over there. You want to hear it? Sure, we'd all up to hear it. Had everybody dying laughing. Well, let's let's hear it. Well, one fella said to the other fella, if you don't think so, brother, you ought to see my wife. <laughs> uh, is uh, is this the whole joke? Oh, no, there was a lot of stuff ahead of it that I didn't hear, you see, but this is the line that had everybody dying laughing. Uh, Gracie, I, I, I don't think you ought to tell that. Too risque. Too naughty. Let's, let's, uh, let's talk about your brother. All right, which one should we talk about? The one who's married or the one who's in love? The one who's in love. Willie, the tall one, the one that has the scar on the chin. Oh, the, uh, the appendicitis scar. <laughs> now, appendicitis is on the stomach, you see. If, if yeah, I know, but Willie was ticklish down there, so they had to operate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll, we'll stop that there, but if you want to follow it, it's in, the link is in the chat, and you can grab it right there and continue. It's, he's doing a great job. Yeah. They were best of friends. Um... Uh, Jack was best man at George and Gracie's wedding. They knew each other their entire lives. Um, I, an interesting story was that Mary Livingston, who was married to Jack, as you know, um, didn't get along with Gracie. And Gracie was always very civil about it. But one night they all went out to dinner and uh, the two ladies were sitting by themselves for a minute and Mary Livingston turned to her. Now Mary came, she wasn't in show business. She, she came like, like Jack always joked about, she worked at May's department store, that's where he met her. And she ended up in that world of uh, entertainment. And she was sitting there with Gracie and she said, Gracie, I saw your show last night. There's a couple of tips that I wanna give you because your delivery was off a little. 
and Gracie just got up and said, excuse me, I have to go to the powder room and just walked away from her. She just, uh, uh, Mary Livingston had a, a, a reputation for being a little difficult with a lot of people. And I guess when you think about it, she was thrown into a world of performers. She ended up having to be a performer because of being married to Jack and he incorporated her into routines and all, but it, it didn't come easy for her. It, it was a lot more difficult. So anyway, that's enough on that one there. Yeah. Yeah, that was a good clip. A uh, good thought on that one with Jack. Yeah. Let's talk about um, what's my th- line. I want to say one more thing about Jack. The opening there, when you saw him come out as Gracie, did you see how he was just holding it? And that's the Jack Benny style. That's the Jack Benny reputation for being able to hold something. Now. Uh, he was in his 70s. He was working in Las Vegas. He was in the wings with um, he was in the wings with his friend Steve Allen, and Steve said to him, "Jack, you know you can get more with a glance than most of these comedians can get with an entire monologue." He said, "Did you ever try timing yourself to see how long you can go without saying anything, get a laugh?" And Jack said, "That's that's interesting. I I'm going to try it now," and they. The announcer says, ladies and gentlemen, Jack Benny. And he comes walking out the way he does that great Jack Benny walk. He gets to center stage. The audience gives him a standing ovation. He does one of his takes like this. The people start laughing. Every time they starts, the laughter starts, he just does a different gesture. They timed it seven minutes of laughter without him saying a word. When it finally calmed down, he killed the entire audience with one word. Well, and that was it. He brought them right down again. So when we talk about the masters, that that didn't happen overnight with Jack. It was something that he had developed over a lifetime. He knew his audience, and more importantly, the audience knew him. And the same thing with us, with, with George and Gracie. The audience knew Gracie. They knew to expect the unexpected when she opened her mouth. And the same thing that you're saying that Jack is doing with a gesture George was doing with his cigar. Those beats, yeah. that time is just letting, it, letting that laughter roll. Now, the nice folks that are online right now, I don't know how many are out there, watch that clip again watch Jack when he makes his entrance, watch how he holds it, and more importantly, he gives a slight, slight glance to George, and then George steps forward into the moment. He's staying in the background, letting Jack get the attention, letting the people see the outfit, letting the people see his expression, letting the people observe this a copycat Gracie Allen and enjoying it, he doesn't step forward until Jack gives him the green light. And that's not something they would have discussed before going on. That's just experience. That's all it is. That's all it is. Good friends. Really good friends. We are almost, sorry, I have to cut you off. We're almost out of time and we have to talk about what's my line because that's what everybody, uh, what we watched in order to prepare. Yeah. I, I love that clip. I, I love it only because, um, first of all, who um, it's Sean Cameron Swayze, right? Uh, who's the host? Yeah, I'm trying to remember now. But write right in, in the comments. <laughs> yeah, right in the beginning, they say uh, that they're just going to be knocking, and uh, he says to the panel. He says, well, we felt if you heard their voices, he slips. He says, if you heard, and then he right away covers himself. You heard their voices or their tone or whatever. He changes it very quickly, but he slips right at the giddy up, letting you know there's more than one person there, but he covers his tracks really well. Um, The other part of it that I love is Steve Allen. It shows he was just a clever, funny guy. Um, when he says, I know who it is, I know it's Lucy and Desi. You know, this is a guy that just was born into show business. And I do a lecture on Steve Allen. And he was raised in the vaudeville world just like that because of his mother. His mother was a great vaudevillian and she had an act. And in my clips, 
um, maybe we should show this sometime. This is a good clip. Uh, he does the act that she perfected in vaudeville, and he plays the straight man with his mother. Terrific piece of material. Um, yeah, Darren would be able to find that too and put it up there, I guess. She's but, hysterical. Yeah, yeah, she's really funny. Okay, go ahead. But anyway, that's why I put that clip there. And then it shows her natural sense of humor was there because he says, okay, you can use your voice now. And she says, don't say anything, George. Damn, boy, is that funny. <laughs> just bam, it just hits it right out of the park. You hear the audience react right away. Gracie knew it. And that wasn't planned. No. It, it's experience. It's experience and understanding. They know who their what their characters are, are supposed to be. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I, I don't think we talked about a little bit this morning, um, that she ran for president as a gag. It really caught on with the country. Uh, people were voting for her when the final, when the final uh, election came through. And FDR won, naturally, but she received, uh, depending on what research you do, several hundred or several thousand votes, write-in votes for Gracie Allen. Kind of interesting, yeah. <laughs> I wonder if there are any comedians today that could get, gather that type of momentum. I don't know. Well, she had a, con she had a convention and 8,000 people showed up. So that's pretty sizable for 1940. 8,000 people showed up at a convention center to see Gracie Allen do her speech. Uh, back in, in the 70s on the Smothers Brothers comedy show, there was a comedian, Pat Paulson, and some of our uh, viewers will remember him, but he did a huge campaign running for president. And every week he would come out and give his, uh, his speeches and uh, what, he was, what he's seeking for uh, as presidential can as a candidate. Was Pat Gracie Paul the first to consider something like this? On that level, right before her, Eddie Cantor, Will Rogers, they tried it, but it was a gag and it just didn't catch any uh, fire. When she did it, people took her serious. And George, they were sitting in the office with the writers one day and they said, we've done everything we can with Gracie. We can't think of anything eh, except maybe she should run for president. And then George turned and said, that's it. And, and they were right. But they thought it was only gonna be a two or three episode gag. One of the fun things about her running for president is that she took it so serious that she would go out of her way to surprise other radio shows and make a guest appearance on that show as Gracie Allen, the, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, candidate. So she would drop in on Fibber McGee and Molly, on Jack Benny, Fred Allen. She would just walk in and just interrupt the show wherever it was and just uh, surprise the audiences. And the audiences got used to that after a while. They couldn't wait to see where Gracie would pop up next. That's so much fun. Well, unsurprisingly, there's more than enough to talk about about uh, with uh, Burns and Allen. I'm sure we could do another 45 minutes. We could do this. We could do this all week. But I want to thank everybody for signing on. Uh, Dal, uh, Dad, Sal, thank you for for being with us and for all of your information and sharing it. If anybody has any last minute questions, we can take them now. If you want to throw those in the chat, otherwise, um, yeah, I'll take a question if you got any. Yeah. Otherwise, we were thinking about, if you are all agreeable to this, we had originally refrained from scheduling anything next Monday. We were going to skip a Monday because of Memorial Day, but we're thinking perhaps it is worthwhile. Uh, we are all still home. Memorial Day isn't exactly the same go out uh, running to the beach and barbecues like it normally is. So if we have the time on Monday, if you are interested, let us know. Just say yes in the comments or click 10 yes. 10 a.m. 10 a.m. At 10 a.m. Yes. Uh, moving forward, they'll all be at 10 a.m. And we'll do that for next Monday as well. And it looks like uh, this was, we did our poll and everybody was interested in female com uh, comedians and comedy teams. Got it. Yeah. So let's focus there. All right. All right, everybody, as always, if you want to follow along, you can follow us on Facebook at St. George Living History right here. We have another clip up about, about Donald O'Connor. Or you can follow us at SalStGeorge.com. And we have all of our information about our live stage shows, which, as you can imagine, are on pause right now. 
but you can check Sal's calendar and see what he has going on. Of course, we have our coffee and comedy scheduled for each Monday at 10 a.m., but he also has some, some lectures he is doing for libraries and other organizations and universities across the island. And if you're not on our mailing list, uh, do get on it because we send out alerts all the time to let you know where I'm going to be performing or some of the libraries are scheduling some brand new lectures that I've never done before. I'm excited about them. We're doing the story of the, the making of Some Like It Hot. And uh, there's so much information that people don't know about on the making of that movie. So. Yep. If you're not on the mailing list, I just shared the, the link in the chat below. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sal. And uh, I'm glad we were able to have a bit more time to talk about Burns and Allen. Definitely worthwhile. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon.